أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الذي هدانا لهذا وما كنا لنهتدي لولا أن هدانا الله والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين شفيع ذنوبنا وطبيب نفوسنا وحبيب قلوبنا أبي القاسم محمد وآله الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين المظلومين وأصحابه المنتجبين ولعنة الله الدائمة على عدائه مجمعين بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم رب الشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وأحل لقدة من لساني يفقه قولي أما بعد السلام عليكم جميعا ورحمة الله وبركاته أعظم الله وجورنا وجوركم بمسابنا بأبي عبد الله الحسين عليه الصلاة والسلام Can we recite a salawat and move forward? Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim Recapping briefly on yesterday's talk and moving on We stated that the whole topic of ours is the rational foundations of Islam and a need to work back to basic. And in that we explain that there's a theory, a conceptual part of religion. And that conceptual part of religion is based squarely on what we term the growth property or on the basis of the nature of our existence. Everything is liberating itself and realizing itself. Everything is on an evolutionary track. Everything is on the move. Everything comes to the fullness of its own existence. Now in terms of this existence, the human being is a loftier animal. We think. We have morality. We understand right from wrong. We yearn a greater pedestal of existence. And therefore, religion in terms of the growth property is an expression of God-human relationship where God is seen at two levels. God is seen as the absolute point of human aspiration, human completion, the wholeness of whatever the human can become. He aspires God. And at the other hand, on the other hand, God is also the intimate factor of human life that prompts this growth through confidence. So this is the definition of religion or deen. God's centricity and human centricity. God-human relation where God marks the point of utmost completion and inspiration and God is the intimate process encouraging that utmost completion. In line with this now, the prophet introduces God as that part of human sort of relation or as that part of human life that human being confides in totally and has full confidence in. The prophet, he stated, make your mistakes but be sincere about it and grow through them. He stated, have confidence in your God. Don't be superstitious. Don't be frightened. Embrace whatever God has chosen for you and through that move on. So God is introduced as the most intimate part within human existence in the wake of human evolution towards self-realization and utmost completion. This is religion. Now in that we stated that the whole theme of going back to basic means that whatever we frown upon within religion, whatever we need to hide away from in religion, whatever is embarrassing in religion needs to be questioned. It either has a historical context or it's either senseless. Well, how do we understand? We stated, if something does not make common sense, then we have to find its historical context and confine it there and say, well, it was something that made sense in this time of history during these challenges those challenges are no longer here. We also made one more statement that the packaged religion that we have today 
is a compilation of historical responses to historical challenges. Those challenges are no longer, the responses have remained with us. And this is what plagues the religion. So something that doesn't make common sense or something that is not intuitively correct and accurate. And we stated we need to explain <coughs> intuition. And indeed, we do need to explain intuition as we're going to today's discussion as we further build our argument. What is intuition we explained? We stated that people say rationally this is right, this is wrong. I will say this is a failure because reason in itself is not a closed thing. We can always inquire what is reason based on. We say, well, this, we see the product of this being this and the product of this being negative and the product of this action being positive. So reason will determine that this is right and this is wrong. I will say, well, why does reason see these things in the way that it sees? The answer is actually reason and rational judgments are based on intuition at the core of it. What is intuition? Intuition is our nature of existence squarely. Now, yesterday we described this. We stated that as existence realizes itself, it has a fundamental property. That fundamental property is self-liberation. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala phrases this in the Quran as there is no coercion at the level of the human intellect. There is no coercion and there ought to be no coercion at all so that the human being can flow freely and self-realize his self. And we find this at an existential level everywhere. If we have a covering on top of a young plant, it will not grow. Remove that covering and the plant will grow. The whole purpose of religion was to remove obstruction and to allow for freedom. And we said that religion is a liberating force. God is a liberating force. So intuition is that which is in accordance with the nature of our existence. So if we were to ask, what is better, giving life or taking life? Reason will say what? Giving life. But what is this based on? On intuition that understands that the flow of existence can only be through giving life. But at the same time, at the same time, when you ask reason, is giving life in all circumstances the best option? The reason will have reservations and say no. At times, taking life is a better option. At the time of warfare or defending ourselves, and our dignity, our homeland. So giving life is not an absolute rule or the sanctity of life, but lack of coercion is an absolute rule and removal of obstruction is an absolute existential principle. So what is intuition? Intuition is that facet of ours which is rooted within our existence, which immediately gives the judgment that is in accordance with the growth property. At the level of our society, we are social beings. How does a society function? Well, we have to trust each other. And therefore, trusting and trust and honesty becomes a moral, but it's a social moral. Imagine if Khalil Bai were to announce that tomorrow the Madlis is at quarter to eight and he was lying. It won't work, would it? If I were to tell you we are going to discuss a theme of back to basics and then I discuss something else, it doesn't work. If I were to tell you I will meet you at 9 o'clock and nothing happens. So trust is that moral, communal moral when we exist collectively which allows the community to function accurately and become productive and growth yielding. Intuition realizes this, that this is a growth property and hence Trust and honesty becomes a moral. Similarly, sacredness of life, being dignified, saying the truth, giving education, so on and so forth. Every moral is based on the growth property and we intuitively know this and at a later date, intellectually, we justify it. This is the process of intuition and common sense is based on intuition. Every rational judgment at the core of it is based on intuition and intuition is rooted within existence and within the growth property of existence which is the singular property of existence as we stated yesterday. 
So now, when we talk about back to basics before we go into today's theme, what we are saying is that all those facets of religion which are not making common sense, what we are saying is, which are intuitively inaccurate, what, means, what that means is that they are inconsistent with existence and nature of existence. What that means is that they are not yielding growth. So anything that is inconsistent with self-liberation, self-realization, or the growth property is inaccurate, even if it goes by the name of religion and by the name of God. Now, let's give an example. Stealing is wrong, isn't it? Why? Because it's inconsistent with growth property. Lying is wrong because it's inconsistent with growth property. Killing is wrong because it's inconsistent with growth property. Would you agree or not with this? So if a religion were to ordain killing, common sense will tell us this is wrong. Why? Because intuition is saying this is wrong. Reason is saying this is wrong. Why? Because it's inconsistent with existence and the property of existence, which is growth. Is that coming across accurately? So let us say, if a religion says that you can steal from your neighbor who is not a Muslim, that is nonsensical. Can you see that? It's inconsistent with common sense. It's inconsistent with the rational proposition of morality. It's inconsistent with intuition, and it's inconsistent with the growth property. At the core of it, it's inconsistent with existence and with growth. Now, Islam, historically, I'm just giving this as an example. Our theme is a bit different of today's. I'm just giving this example. Islam, at its outset, saw the world very differently. There were other parts of the world that were warring with Islam, yes? So the Islam worldview was the Muslim world, the world at peace with Islam, and the world that was the antagonist, the world at war with Islam. Now in that paradigm, we had this stipulation that a Muslim can take wealth from the world that is at war with Islam in order to weaken that world. Yes? Is that understood? That a Muslim could steal from a non-Muslim who was at war with Islam in order to weaken the non-Muslim. Have you got that? Now that might have been historically in accordance with the growth property because that would ensure the growth of the Muslim world against an ungodly world. But in today's world, when the paradigm has shifted totally, we are in the West. This is not a world at war with Islam. These are nation states in the modern world. That paradigm has gone. So now if a fatwa comes out, as they did in 1970s, there were fatwas in 1970s, that you can steal from the non-Muslim, and as a result in the UK where I lived, people used to people used to fraud the system all the time. They used to make false insurance claims and take money in the name of Islam because Islam allowed taking the wealth of a non-Muslim. But that paradigm is not there. And intuitively, we all knew that this is wrong. Absolutely wrong. And it is wrong because it is inconsistent with the growth property. These people, these beautiful people, that are in the Western countries, they are noble people. They are moral individuals. They are godly souls. They are not at war with Islam. They are not ungodly. They are not trying to bar godliness. Stealing from them is stealing from God himself. So intuitively we know that this is wrong. It doesn't make common sense. Because it is inconsistent with the growth property. This is what we mean by intuition. Anything that does not accord to intuition or common sense is not according with the growth property of self-liberation and self-realization. This is what we are trying to say, but we're going to work into this theme much further. Now, of course, we say that women are noble creatures. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives them the same pedestal as he gives man in his book and same spiritual rank and spiritual rights. In fact, I will go beyond this at the conceptual level and theoretical level. We, the human soul, is neither a man nor a woman, if we read the Quran. 
The Quran says, I've created you from one soul and then created its pair in order to procreate and for recognition of God himself. Yes? Now, on the one hand, women have equal spiritual rank and status with God. But socially, they rank below man. Is it intuitively accurate to say that a woman cannot get divorced from a man and she has to wait five years before somebody is benevolent enough and gives her her divorce? And the man runs away and refuses to divorce her. Intuitively, this is inaccurate. This is inconsistent with human rights. It's inconsistent with the growth property. So these are the sort of things we will be working towards. Now, today, we stated that the broad category of Islamic teachings are theology, morality, and ahkam. We were working on theology, and we stated religion is an expression of God-human relationship where God is the force of liberation, where for God is the force of encouragement towards self-actualization, where God is the absolute state of accomplishment. That is the essence, yes? The ahkam are the forms to get us there. Ahkam is at the lowest level, yes? The highest level is this theory and the concept that we have to evolve to the utmost. And God, as opposed to being the restrictive factor, is the encouraging factor. Because in existence, if anything restricts existence, it becomes null and void. Religion can only work if it encourages God, growth and self-liberation. That is the theory. Now, that is theology. At the bottom, you get ahkam. What do you get in the middle? We get morality. And that is the goal of human existence in this world. What do we mean by morality? What we mean by morality is not what is understood in the secular world today, doing good for the sake of good. In religion, morality means something different. It means spiritual righteousness, spiritual wholesomeness, spiritual morality. What is the meaning of spiritual morality? That a person is doing good in order to become a complete human being. Actualization of the fullest potential within the human individual. And the ahkam are going to help the human individual to attain that fullest self-realization. So spiritual morality means the actualization of the fullest potential of the human being. Now what does that mean? If we look at the verses of the Quran, this comes out very clearly. Allah says in Surah Al Imran, He is the one who fashions you in the wombs as and how He wants. The Prophet said that Allah has created you in His image. What does that mean? God doesn't have a face or a form, yes? So, in the image of God means what? That all of the beauty. Hidden within God is hidden within me and you. The fact that the angels have prostrated in front of me and you, the fact that the angel said to Allah that he will close bloodshed and corruption and Allah still says even then he is better than you. Imagine. The angels, they protested, didn't they? They said, وَنَحْنُ نُسَبِّحُ بِحَمْدِكَ وَنُقَدِّسُ لَكَ We do your tasbih, we hold you complete in the affirmative sense. And we negate all the deficiencies from you. Whereas he is going to spill blood and he's going to cause corruption in the land. Allah says, even then he is better than you. Why? Because we have something tremendous in us that the angels cannot even realize. The Prophet said he has created you in his image. The whole process of life is a process in which we are encouraged by God to become God-like. We are created in the image of God. And the process of life is for us to become God-like. We have not understood this point at all. You see, my and your world is, I do good and Allah will give me reward. I do bad and Allah will punish me. We don't realize that I am the reward and I am the punishment on myself. It can't be otherwise. 
There is no other heaven that I'm going to go to. I create the heaven myself. It's in the process of creation. We are all in this Imam Barga right now. But is it the same hole that we see? You can't even see what I see and I can't see what you see. When I say this is green, I can't show you what I'm seeing. You have your own understanding of green. It's a very private world. You are in a world of your own and I'm in a world of my own. Do you not see this? <coughs> you are the people who are acquainted with this hole. Your understanding is very different from my understanding. You're looking at me from that direction. I'm looking at you from this direction. Being in the same hall, we are in different halls altogether. In fact, if there are 150 people here, there are 150 universes sitting here. Everyone on their own individual journey. Do you not see how Quran so beautifully talks of the Lord of Moses, the Lord of Isa, the Lord of Ibrahim? He talks of the Rabb Musa, the Rabb of Ibrahim, and the Rabb of Ismail. Everybody has this private, personal, beautiful connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that is their own and nobody else's. We all have the same mother, yet we all relate to that mother in a very individualistic manner that no other brother relates to or sister or sibling relates to. Me and my siblings have the same parents. But we all relate to them very, very differently. The whole process of life has not been understood. You see, the Quran is very explicit about these things. And it makes perfect sense that you all have your personal journeys, but you affect each other. Your reward and your punishment, your destiny, your judgment are immediately with you. If me and a common thug are placed inside the dungeon of prison. The prison is the same thing. The common thug does not feel pain, apart from the physical pain. But a noble man will feel psychological pain beyond the physical pain. They are in the same dungeon and they are in a different dungeon altogether. You take two people and place them in paradise. One will rejoice differently and the other one will rejoice differently. You take two people to a Musha'ira, let's say a Khoja and somebody from Lucknow. And when beautiful Urdu poetry is recited, the guy from Lucknow will start banging his head in ecstasy. And the Khoja will just look at him and say, what's going on? Because one understands the words very differently and the other one understands them very differently. This is the whole thing that the Prophet was explaining to us, that the end game is for you to arrive at that pedestal of godliness. Your judgment, your punishment, your reward is you yourself. Yes, there is a big paradise there, but your understanding of the paradise is limited to you yourself. And whatever will bar you in your paradise is you yourself. The more you can create, the greater your paradise will be. Tell me something. When me and you are asleep, let's say if there's a dream capsule, if I'm in a dream capsule, who can stop me from dreaming a world that is infinite? And if I can make that into my reality, who can tell me that my reality is other than that? Tell me. I don't even need an infinite space. All I need is a place to dream properly and make that dream into a reality. Yes? I don't need unlimited universe or unlimited paradise. I can make my own paradise. The only thing that restricts me is what? my own lack of imagination. So the end game from the teachings was that there is a beauty within me, there is a beauty within you. That beauty needs to be unleashed. It needs to be realized by itself. And therefore, the human being needs to evolve themselves at their individual levels. And that was supposed to be the end game. What we call spiritual morality, we need to explain a bit more. You find a good human, per se. Give charity for the sake of giving charity. And we've seen such noble human beings who are so good, who give everything away. But still, when you look into their personalities, of course, they will all go to paradise. Somebody says to me, or asked me, will Mother Teresa go to paradise? I said, if she doesn't make it to paradise, and people like me have no chance to get there. The paradise belongs to her. It kisses her feet, my God. 
if a noble woman like that, who is an exemplary for me, doesn't go into paradise, then where will I go? I hope she goes to paradise and intercedes for me so that I can go to paradise. This is how the Muslims think, by the way. They're worried about Mother Teresa and they don't even understand what their own journey is about. You know, when the prophets were asked, what about all those people who went before us who are not Muslims? Every prophet was told this. What will happen to them? The prophets never dared. Do you know what they said? The prophets said, we don't know, Allah knows best. This is how the prophets humbled themselves. The prophet Muhammad sallallahu says in the Quran, The Prophet Muhammad in the Quran says, I don't know what will be done to me. And I don't know what will be done to you. My God and a Muslim has so much arrogance to say, I will go to paradise. And the rest of the world will be damned to hell. That statement in itself shows that the Muslim is damned to hell himself. For anybody who knows, does not have enough godliness in their hearts to care for the other human beings and to appreciate their goodness. I'm asking the Muslims, what Quran do you read, O people? Look at our understanding. I'm going with the theme. We feel we are the chosen ones, don't we? We are the noble ones. We are the chosen ones. We are this, we are that. Did you decide to take birth in this household in which you've taken birth? Tell me. Did I engineer my parents and I got birth in a household which is Imami and a Shia? Or a Sunni or a Buddhist? Who's taken, brought me here? How can I be the chosen one when I didn't, when I didn't even decide in which religion to take birth? Isn't it amazing that every human being, and I'm repeating myself from two days, ends up justifying the truth of the religion in which they take birth? Isn't it amazing? If we had taken birth in Buddhism today, we would have justified with such passion the truth of Buddhism. Doesn't that say something to us? That something has gone wrong somewhere? In any case, spiritual morality means to bring about godliness. Now, when you see a good human being, they are charitable, they're noble, they're good. But when we examine further their personality, what do we see? We find that they might be very charitable, yet they might also be insecure within themselves. They might be charitable, but they might be frightened people. They might be charitable, but they don't have bravery in them. What does spiritual morality mean? Spiritual morality means to genuinely surrender to Allah and to become God-like. Look at the noble prophets. These noble prophets were charitable. And at the same time, they were people who were fearless. They had fear and they were able to reconcile their human frailties and fear within godliness. They were people who were truthful. Every aspect of their personality was completed. This is what we mean by spiritual morality, that every facet of human existence is completed and realized to the fullness of itself. That is what we mean by spiritual morality. Not only one aspect, humanism that we have today, is good, it's noble, I agree with it. But it is just an aspect of the truth. Religious morality, if understood properly in its essence, it's the completest truth and the completest journey for human existence. Because God is the absolute completion. God is all-knowing, all-living, all-capable, all-benevolent, all-forgiving, all-merciful. So if a person is charitable and lacks mercy, they have not completed themselves fully. If a person <coughs> is knowledgeable but cannot let go of the hurt, then they have not completed themselves fully. Look at Hussein ibn Ali, the way he explains this human journey. He is within the Al-Qamha. The narration is this, that he cups water and draws it near to himself, observes the water. There are arrows fired at Hussein ibn Ali. One penetrates his neck and the other one his forehead. And he looks towards them as the blood gushes from him. But he is undeterred. And then they say, Hussein, shall you partake of the cold water of the Euphrates while your tents are being looted? At that point, like a raging lion, he ascends his steed and comes out of the Alqama and calls out our people, if you are not Muslims, if 
you have no fear of accountability of hereafter, if you have no Arab pride in you, then at least be free man in this world of yours. That is the status that awaits a human individual. Tell me, today, in this journey of life, when I die, what shall you give to the earth of me? You will place me inside the earth. You will take away every single thing that distinguishes me, won't you? And Allah, in order to spare me in dignity, will tell you to place two garments on me. But even the ring with which I worship God, he will tell you, take it off. Even the Quran that I have read will not come with me. And if that Quran you place inside the grave with me, I challenge you, open my grave. After a year, you will find that that Quran has been consumed by the creatures of the earth. Even that Quran will not be there. So what is going in this journey? Me, myself what I become. And that was the end game. That, oh human being, you are here for a purpose. To complete your own inner self. You are to become godly. Let's explain that a bit more. When a fetus is within the womb, if I were to tell the fetus, complete your journey. And if the fetus took a tasbih and started doing the dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but did not complete its organs and its limbs. If the fetus were to take birth without lungs and hearts and nose and ears and hands, it would be severely deformed, wouldn't it? It will not be able to sustain the challenges of this world because it doesn't have the tools. The journey of the fetus within the womb is what? To complete its physical being. When me and you come into this world and we are told, complete your journey, what is the journey that we are completing? Is it the journey of shouting at each other? Of cursing each other? Of telling each other how each other are wrong? Of amassing this world and wealth? Of getting power? But then all of this will not accompany me inside my grave. So none of this meant anything. When the fetus completes its journey, all of it accompanies the fetus, the young baby inside this world, doesn't it? The hands, the feet, the organ, the face, the eyes, everything comes with it in this world because it completed its journey. But now today, when I am completing my journey, I have palaces with me. Will you bury them with me? I have money with me. Will you bury it with me? I have armies with, you, with me. Will you bury it with me? I have library of books with me. Will you bury it with me? What will you bury with me? Nothing but myself. And even that within a year will have decayed. Open my grave and you will see me. You will see a man who was so noble at one point, who ascended the pulpit. Today is not even found there. Even his skull has decayed. So what am I taking with me in this journey? There is only one thing for this journey. And that is that we actualize ourselves. We become godly beings. And that's about it. And that is the end game and the essence and the ahkam of Islam are geared towards bringing about that journey. Anything inconsistent with that is senseless. Now, when the Prophet brought in his system, my time has run away so quickly today. When the Prophet brought in his system, how did he bring it in? You know, we are totally mistaken. There was a drought in Medina. So the businessmen had hoarded certain crops and they had quadrupled the prices. They were charging extortionate prices for those crops. So the people went to the Prophet. They said, Ya Rasulullah, fix the prices for this commodity. You know what the Prophet replied? Inni akrah at tasair. I dislike fixing prices. Why? Look at the logic of the Prophet. If the promise of hereafter is not enough to move them from their greed. No amount of fixing of prices will do anything for them. They will not become good human beings under any rate. Imagine. Today's Islam is based on the whip, isn't it? If you don't do this, this will happen. If you don't do this, this will happen. This is the decadence of humanity. Human being has fallen from its pedestal of greatness. It has arrived to a level of thuggery. In the time of the Prophet, 
the punishment was meant for the lowest common denominator for the thugs a noble man would never stoop to that limit allahu akbar my god imagine qais with his layla does qais need to be threatened qais finds pleasure with his layla he has fallen in love with his layla he will sacrifice his sleep at night for his layla he will sacrifice his world for his layla he doesn't have to be threatened to go to layla he yearns layla and goes to her goes to her am i supposed to be threatened to go and spend time with my mother i yearn my mother from the time i have lost her i have cried if only i could get one more day with her does a noble man need to be threatened a dignified man is not forced to do good by the whip a dignified man his heritage is goodness a noble man is a man who yearns to complete himself yearns to be with allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the law system of the prophet was a minimalistic one as we will describe from tomorrow onwards it was a minimalistic one that was geared towards bringing about a decent noble godly human being that was the end game and nothing else it's unfortunate that the muslims have placed so much value on law that does not bring about morality and godliness people pray 100 rakat namaz and they get so tired they start to start swearing at each other is this what we are supposed to become after 100 rakat namaz isn't it better to pray 2 rakat namaz calmly and be calm do you really think this makes sense all that what we are doing is it really activating that godliness in me 20 years ago i was insecure 20 years on i'm still insecure what have i achieved from this life of mine 20 years ago i was fighting against time 20 years on i'm still fighting against time and and time is winning all the time what have i achieved through all of this 20 years ago I was debating with others that I am right and you are wrong. 20 years on, I'm still doing the same thing. <laughs> and the great prophet of mine, he goes to the people of other faith and he says, you are right and so are we. Imagine. Um, amazing, isn't it? I'm just going to say this. I say it in every, every, every mudlis. Salman was saddened in Medina when he joined the prophet. He said, what will become of my Christian brethren that I've left behind? The prophet was saddened. Are they all doomed? The verse of the Quran was revealed. Indeed, those who believe, the Jews, the Christians, the Sabians, amongst these four, and I believe he only mentioned these four because only those four were available in Medina. Amongst these four, whoever believes in Allah, the last day, does righteous deeds, they will have their reward and no fear will come upon them and no regret. Allah does not distinguish a Muslim from a Christian, from a Jew, from a Sabian. He puts them all on the same pedestal. That was my prophet. That was my God. God was saying, look, the end game is what you are becoming. You can read this book or this book or this book or this book. What you become through reading those books is important, not the book that you read. How interesting is that? How interesting is that? I say to myself, because I read this book, I have to have salvation. But God says to me, he has read another book and he has become a better human being and you have regressed in your humanity. We have totally misunderstood what is happening. I'm not saying you have, I'm sure you all know, but people like me have totally misunderstood. The end game is to become godly. The world is an opportunity for that godliness as we go into the story of this master of ours the godliest person that we see i want to say something before and then go into the full narration i always say this that had i been in the place of hussein ibn ali my reaction would have been very different had hur come to me on the day of ashura hur is that person due to whom Hussein finds himself in Karbala, undeniably. As we'll narrate, who is the person that is the immediate cause of Hussein's tribulations? 
undeniably. If Hur were to come to me on the day of Ashura, I would have said, Hur, looking at you offends me. It is better you stay on that side and I put you to death. Because of you, I am trapped in this place. And now you have the nerve to come to me and to tell me that you want to repent. This is how I would have reacted. But look at the godly stature of Hussein ibn Ali. Amazing. Amazing. He realizes whatever has been destined has come to pass. He realizes that this man has become godly. He is not the same whore that he meant at Du Hassam or any other place. He is a different person altogether. When Hur comes to Hussein, what does Hussein say? Hussein humbles himself. And he says, Hur, Allah has forgiven you. And does not oblige Hur, does not make him feel embarrassed. This is the godly stature and the status of Hussein ibn Ali. That is why Hussein has become the pulse of humanity. Hussein relates to humanity at large through his godliness that we all share equally. Hussein Salamullah is moving from Hijaz onwards. And as they move, a group of his companions, they cry out, Allahu Akbar. Hussein says, indeed, Allah is great. But what is the cause of this takbir at this point? They say, we see the date palms of Kufa. With Hussein, our people who are acquainted with the route, they say, we are at a great distance from Kufa. When they looked closely, they found an army drowned in armor approaching them. Al Hussein said, we will camp here and await them. That was an army under the command of Hur ibn Yazid al-Riyahi. An army of a thousand men. The people of that army narrate, we were thirsty, fatigued, in no state to conduct a battle. As Hussein saw us, he said to his sons, his brothers, his companions, open the water skins and quench their thirst. And when you have given them water, give their animals water. A last person from amongst the army says, I was the last one. When Hussein saw me, he said, kneel your horse and drink from this water and then feed your horse. When we drank, it was a time for the Salat of Dhuhr. Hajjaj bin Masruq gave the Adhan. Hussein turned to the army of Hur. And he said to the army of Hur, O people, at your summoning I have come here. If you have taken away allegiance, let me be. And let me return to my homeland. <coughs> Hajjaj bin Masruq gave a second Adhan. Hussein said to the army, I will pray with my people. Hur, attend to your prayers. Who said, O Hussein, we will all pray behind you. After praying behind Hussein, Hur comes to Hussein and says to Hussein, O Hussein, I have been instructed to hand you over to Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad in Kufa or else not to part company with you. Hussein said, O Hur, do what you have to. But if you were to let me go, then that would be the most righteous thing to do. Who said, O oh, Hussein, I have no doubt that if you were to engage in battle with these people, they will overcome you and they will kill you. Hussein, enraged at this, <coughs> he said, O oh, Hur, do you frighten me with death? And then he chanted certain verses. What blemish can come upon a youth who gives his life in the way of Islam and for righteousness? If he dies, then dies nobly. If he lives, then he lives without any regret. It is sufficient for you and the likes of you, O Hur, that you call yourself a free man and your nose is rubbed in the dust of humility. Hur looked at Hussein, startled. As Hussein mounted his steed <coughs> and was about to spur his horse, Hur audaciously grabbed the reins of Hussein's horse. Hussein, enraged, looked at Hur. May your mother weep at your death, O Hur. Hussein, Hur was moved back, shocked. He said, Hussein, if any man amongst the Arabs 
would have uttered these words, I would have responded in a like manner. But what may I do when your mother is the queen of women? I can do nothing but venerate her. Salawat. <coughs> <coughs> Hur dispatched, dispatched a letter to Abaydullah ibn Ziyad, asking him for further instructions. Hussein moved on. The reply came to Hur that either bring Hussein back to me or confine him in a place where there is no water and no pasture. Hussein comes to Karbala, camps near the Al Qama. On the 7th, Hussein's camp is moved away from the Al Qama. And the enemy camps next to the al Kama. It is the night of Ashura. And Hur is in deep contemplation. Before the dawn, Hur comes to Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad. Hur comes to Amr ibn Sa'ad. And he said, O Amr, shall a war ensue tomorrow at daybreak? <coughs> Amr said, indeed. Within no time you shall see heads flying and arms being cut and their bodies being trampled upon by the hooves of our horses. When Hur heard this, he trembled in awe. Hur ascended his steed at the crack of dawn. Qurra ibn Qais says, I saw Hur from afar. And Hur looked at me as I approached him. He said, Qurra. Have you watered your horse? I said, no. He said, go and water your horse. As I left for watering my horse, I saw him trembling. I said, Hur, by Allah, you are the bravest of the man in the Syrian army. Why do you tremble in this way? He said, by God, I see myself between paradise and hell. And I shall not prefer hell over paradise. As Hur advanced, Muhajir called on to Hur. He said, Hur, are you planning to preempt the attack upon Hussein? Hur said, silence, O man. As Hur went, his two sons, Ali and Bukair, joined him, and his brother joined him. As Hur went away, made way towards Hussein, Hussein looked at Hur from afar. And he said to Abbas, Abbas, a guest of mine approaches. Receive him well and bring him to me. Hur approaches Hussein and says, Oh Hussein, I come penitent to you, a beggar of your forgiveness. Oh Hussein, I am the one who is guilty for you to be trapped in this place. Oh Hussein, is there mercy in your heart for the likes of me? Hussein tearfully said to Hur, Oh brother, not only I, my Lord, has forgiven you. Hur, descend from your steed and come to me. He said, Oh Hussein, if you were to allow me, let me go to the daughters of the Prophet and seek their forgiveness. He said, So be it. Who rides up to the tents of the women of Hussein and he calls out, Oh granddaughters of Muhammad, before you crumbs, the one who is guilty of trapping you in this place, is there forgiveness in your hearts for the likes of me? Their cries arose and filled the air. As they cried, Hur was moved. He stepped down from his steed and began to slap his face and throw dust upon his head. And he said, if only my hands would have been paralyzed before I grabbed the reins of Hussein's steed. If only my tongue were to have been cut before I spoke those words to Hussein. Fizza ran to Hur. She said, oh Hur, enough. The daughters of the Prophet send you their best wishes and pray for you, whose heart was consoled by this. He comes to Hussein. He says, Oh Hussein, allow me to join you in battle against this godless people and my sons and my brother. But look at this whore. He sends off his son Ali to fight. Ali fights and then comes back to Hur and says, Oh father, Indeed, thirst overpowers me. Who said, O oh, Ali, do not ask for water. The grandson of the Prophet is thirsty. Go and fight. 
His grandfather will quench your thirst. Ali fought. And Ali fought. And when Ali fought, Hur looked at him with pride. Hur was fighting on one side and looking at the battle of Ali on the other and looked at, looks at him with pride. When Ali receives a blow upon his head and falls to the ground, unlike fathers, who raises his head in pride and turns to the right and left and he says, did you see how my son gave his life for Hussein? He rides up to his son, takes his head into his lap and he says, oh child, you have made me a proud father. You have given me the courage to look Hussein in the eye now. He breaks into a smile. He says, oh child, what is the reason for your smile? He says, the grandfather of Hussein indeed has come to me with the goblet of kosher and quenches my thirst. Who goes for his battle on a one-to-one -one combat? He kills many of the enemies until his horse is lame. He comes upon his feet and fights with the enemies of Hussein until a blow is struck on the back of his head. As Hur arrives to the dust of Karbala, he calls out, O oh, Aba Abdullah, I bid you my final farewell. Hussein with Habib rushes to Hur's side, takes Hur's head into his lap. And as he takes Hur's head into his lap, Habib looks at Hur upon his last breaths. And Hur breaks into a faint smile. Habib says, Oh Hur, do you see his grandfather? Hur said, No, O oh Habib, I do not. Habib asks him, Then why do you smile, O oh Hur? He says, Because I find my head in the lap of Hussein ibn Ali. Hussein finds a wound on the forehead of Habib of Hur, and he ties it with a handkerchief. I will say, O oh Hur, the handkerchief of Fatima remains upon your forehead till eternity. Come to Shah Mehariba and see how the chadar of Fatima is extracted from the head of the daughters of Fatima. Allah la'natul ala al-qawmi al-zalimeen wa sayya'alamu al-ladhina dhalamu ayyamun qalibin yanqalibun. Matim Hussain.